Okay, we're recording now. Um, I'm going to start this lecture. This is going to be about the Second World War, and let's get up to the beginning here. All right, a couple of pieces of good news here. I'm going to break this chapter up over two weeks because there's a lot to take in here. It's a big subject. Uh, a lot of students come to the class knowing quite a bit about the Second World War to begin with. But it's an important period that I don't really want to rush through so much. It changes some things in the United States. It changes the United States status in the world. Um, and we're still living with the legacy of the Second World War. So there's some things that I, I want to make sure that we don't rush over. So I think I'm going to try for, let me check my timing here. Uh, I'm going to try for a couple 10-minute videos this week and maybe a couple 10-minute 10 minutes, 10 minute videos next week. Uh, to get through this. So I'm going to try to get through about uh, 12, slides, 12 slides over the two videos of this week and um, get to just about the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. These lectures are going to be talking about um, the rise of two world powers across the world from each other, Japan and Germany, and set the stage for um, the Second World War and the entry of uh, European nations into the Second World War, uh, and we'll go up into uh, the start of the United States uh, participation in the war. So just a little heads up on what to expect. Okay, some big things to note about the Second World War. It is to date, and hopefully will remain, uh, the deadliest and most destructive war in human history. And some things to break that down a little bit as far as numbers to give you the perspective of this. Very deadly, very costly for lives. Um, 80 million, it's estimated, died during the period of the Second World War. Now, I don't think I have this on the slide. I kind of take this for granted because I've known this for such a long time. But if you're taking notes here, write down the period or the duration of the Second World War as being from 1939 to 1945. And with the United States coming into the war late, kind of like World War I, they participate from the end of 1941 through the year, the final years of the war, 1945. So 1939 through 1945, the total duration of the Second World War and then the United States participation in that war, the end of 1941, really December of 1941, all the way through 1945. Okay, we just needed to get that out there. Okay, so 80 million died in the total conflict during this really six year period. Another um, factor of the Second World War is that there's widespread spread killing, especially on battlefronts, but also there's this really dark element of how nations, especially Germany, industrialize that killing to where they're not just killing um, combatants or enemy soldiers and so forth, they're actually rounding up people and using a very sick application of industrial practices in order to kill people as quickly and as bad as it sounds, as efficiently as possible. So it's a very dark element we get from this period of World War II. I think we can all identify and register immediately what I mean when I say the Holocaust, okay? This is what we're talking about. The Holocaust is really this type of industrialized genocide. Um, along with that industrialized genocide, we get some very fearsome technology. What comes to mind probably immediately is the atomic bomb. And the atomic, atomic bomb is used by the United States effectively to end the war um, as it's dropped on Japan. But that isn't the only piece of fearsome technology that comes out of the war. Um, as the situation becomes more desperate for countries trying to win this thing, the effort to amp up, especially weaponry, uh, really increases. So we get things like long-range bombers that can take a very heavy load of bombs much further than ever before and can drop them on cities. So we have the technology during the Second World War. It gets very um, 
advanced in order to take out complete cities in bombing efforts, not just with atomic bombs, but with heavy payload bombing in Germany, especially as the Allies get together and start to, um, to beat Germany in the Second World War. So fearsome technology. Uh, U.S. emerges out of the war as uh, something that we hadn't used this term before, a superpower. So the Soviet Union eventually, after the Second World War, will compete with, that, uh, with the United States for that title of superpower. But emerging right after the Second World War, the U.S. really fares the best of any countries. The countries in Europe are devastated by the war. The U.S., although they participated in the war and lost uh, lots of personnel, men, especially during the war, the U.S. never really suffered any kind of um, home invasions or, or, or invasions to our country, except the attack on Pearl Harbor, of course. All right, so the U.S. emerges from the Second World War as a superpower. Now, this is a big thing to take note of. This is a U.S. history class. And if we start to think about, you know, why is our country so strong and uh, why do we enjoy so, so much advantages economically and politically and so forth. Um, World War II really allows the United States to emerge as the most powerful country in the world. Okay, it, also World War II unleashes new social forces on the world um, at the end of the United States, at the end of uh, World War II, okay? Probably the most notable I can, sit, I can think of uh, right away is we get an element after the war, after World War II based on that fearsome technology, the atom bomb, that people have um, an idea that for probably maybe the first time that the entire population of the planet can be killed um, if there's enough effort put into things like atomic um, weaponry and so forth. So new social forces, and that's going to affect all kinds of things um, from that point on. All right, so that's an introduction to what the World War II um, brings us as far as the death, the destruction, the change in the world order, and the new way of looking at things that come about. Okay, well, let's start in the, in the Pacific Ocean because this is an important part of U, the U.S.'s role in the Second World War. Uh, this is where the U.S. starts to enter the war. And their main foe in the Pacific, I think most of us know, is Japan. So we're going to talk about Japan a little bit. Why was Japan such a foe to the United States? And why? what would prompt them to do something like attack a military installation, a Navy installation in uh, the territory of Hawaii? So we have to think a little bit about what Japan was doing at this time. Okay, Japan, from the end of the 19th century into the early 20th century, was kind of flexing its muscles, especially out in uh, Eastern Asian region, regions and places like the Sea of Japan and the South China Sea. Um, now they create kind of a artificial conflict with Manchuria, which is a Northern part of China. And in 1931, based on an attack on a train station that it looked when we're looking back at it, that Japan kind of staged in order to have justification for invading Manchuria, right? They invade Manchuria in 1931. When they do that, the world sort of looks on and um, many world uh, powers condemn Japan's invasion of Manchuria. Um, it's seen as an act of an aggress ag aggression, unjustified, so much of the world comes to in defense of Manchuria. Now, the League of Nations is still going on at this time. So this would be the precursor of the United Nations. So condemnation by the League of Nations would have an effect on Japan. The United States is unified with those critics of Japan's invasion of Manchuria. So eventually, in 1933, Japan withdraws from the League of Nations. Right? And ice begins to isolate itself, right? It becomes isolated, but at the same time, it starts to draw on <clears throat> military ideas. It starts to become militarized. It starts to end diplomacy with Western and European powers, and the U.S. especially. So more isolation. And then in 1937... 
uh, as it's built its military and its military strengths, it launches a full-scale invasion of China under much condemnation from the world at this point. The U.S. backs China, right? Now, is the U.S. going to intervene? Strategically, there's a reason for them to do so because this is, even though it's the Pacific Ocean, the largest, largest ocean in the world, the U.S. still has lots of interest in the Pacific, especially in places like the Philippines, which we've talked about. So this is getting the U.S. quite nervous about the strength of Japan in East Asia. Problem is, the U.S. military is not as good as Japan's, at least at not at that point. So the U.S. has some um, reservations about taking on Japan. Uh, Japan's military, because of a concerted effort to build it up over about a decade or so, is very good. Not only does it have the third largest navy in the world, but its um, land army and its navy are very technologically advanced. Uh, Japan has done very well in technologically engineering, physics, and these kinds of things. So Japan is a very formidable military force uh, by the end of the 1930s. And here's a map. I'll end with this map. This tells you, it shows you the um, progression of Japanese imperialism from the end of the 19th century all the way until about the start of the Second World War, right here in 1939. Okay, so they've been gradually taking over large swaths of East Asia. Here's to, um, Japan, capital is Tokyo. Here's Manchuria, all right? And then by the invasion of the mid-1930s, late 1930s, we see Jap Jap Japanese occupation um, throughout the coastline of China. How, is Chi how are the Chinese responding? Their leader, Chiang Kai-shek, is trying to rally a military response to the Japanese. As I said, the Japanese are very formal, or very formidable militarily and um, have a lot of advantage in that. Okay, so you can take a look at this map. Now here's the Philippines too. Japanese has, Jap the J Japanese have control um, of so much of this. So this makes the United States nervous. And it sort of poises Japan and the United States to be at strict conflict with each other not militarily yet, but as far as resources and control and power in the Pacific Ocean, uh, this is something that's making lots of American uh, policymakers nervous. And we'll end the first part of this, the video there.